church that was built in 1175, St Mary's, where according to legend, Fire Tuck conducts a service of which Robin Hood marries Maid Marian in the outside archway to the church. We just left the church of St Mary and we're going to now head up towards the major road. Morning, so today we're on the second part of the Robin Hood Trail. Uh, today we're up at Edwinstone and we've just uh, been to St Mary's where Maid Marian and Robin Hood married, but we're by Fire Top. And now we're heading up to the Major Oaks, uh, the tree that uh, Robin Hood and his Marian man uh, frequently acquainted. Here we have the Major Oak, an old English oak that is believed to be 800 to 900 years old. Its girth is 10 metres and the oak is where Robin Hood and his merry men used to shelter when they slept. Although propped up since the Victorian era and now fenced off, I remember as a child that uh, you could climb on and go into its hollow centre. So we're walking along the King's Highway, which was a road from London to York. It went straight through Sherwood Forest. It's probably the road or the similar sort of path that uh, Harold, as in King Harold in 1066, uh, when he went up to York to fight the Vikings. And then he headed back down to the South Coast, where again he had to fight William the Conqueror, which obviously he lost with his life with an arrow to the eye. Hopefully it wasn't Robin Hood that shot that arrow. Uh, now, right at the crossroads, there's a big old tree. So I'm guessing that's an oak tree and that's 150 years old. And that is center tree. The significance of center tree is it's the center point of Sherwood Forest. As in, it's 18 kilometers from here to Nottingham Castle. And then it is also 18 kilometers north of here, Worksop, which is where Sherwood Forest, the main part of the forest was meant to finish. Another lovely day, and uh, at the moment we're walking towards Budby, a little hamlet village of, I believe, 30 main properties, but all painted pink. Looks like some heavy machinery has been through here, and uh, just notice this sign. It's like a military training area. Do know that this area was used in the First and Second World War as a training area, but I thought. The MOD is selling property off there, or land off left, right and centre. This would have been one of the places that did sell off. Let's uh, get to Budby now.
Okay, so we were going to go to Budby Castle, private house, no entry. Uh, extensive electric gate there. Budby Castle, also known as Castle William, is now privately owned, but originally built to house the boat crews of Forsby in the gardens is the grave of William Scott, captain of the Mary, who died in 1756. Let me just tell you about Chameleon Lodge. So the name Chameleon Lodge was taken from the Roman goddess. This property has been most associated with the head woodsmen who have worked at Forsby Estate. It was also actually called the Red House, not because of the pink limestone wash, but it's because the roof tiles used to be uh, red. We're going to walk down the road now and we're going to go to Forsby Hall. So I was hoping to find some pheasants along the way, although I don't think he can tell me what the story is now. Oh well, anyone fancy a bit of roadkill? And not easy to see, but in the centre of the picture is the Great Lake of Fallsby. And then behind it, I believe that is the wood yard. Now I was expecting a wooden hut or a wooden building. Oh, it's quite grand. In 1876, the third Earl of Mamba, Sydney, he paid £64,000 for the wood yard to be built. But if that is part of the wood yard, according to Matt, it should be around that location. It does look a little bit worth a few pennies, so more than a wooden shed. Something tells me these guys are a bit hungry, as there's not much grass there for them to chew. They have a particular breed here. Now, obviously, you can see the big horns just in front. There's a pheasant wandering off. So, we are on Forsby Estate now. Forsby Hall is a Grade 1 listed 19th century country house. The land was purchased in 1633 by Robert Pierpoint, 1st Earl of Kingston upon Hall. His son, Henry II Earl, built the first Grand Hall in 1670 after his father died in the English Civil War in 1643. Over the next 100 years, the different Earls remodelled the Hall, making it larger and grander. The house was the birthplace of Lady Mary Pierpoint, wife of Edward Wortley Montagu in 1689. Edward was the first British ambassador to the Ottoman Empire in 1716. The second Duke of Kingston upon Hull, Evelyn Pierpoint, was given an estate, but in 1746 a fire destroyed the house. Afterwards, the, the Duke had the hall rebuilt in 1767, on the same site as well as having the grounds landscaped. Forsby Hall is one of the four country houses and estates in the Dukeries, which is all part of the area of North Nottinghamshire and have been occupied by Dukes at one time or another in their history. After Evelyn's death, the Duke's nephew Charles Meadows, a Royal Navy officer, took the name of Pierpoint and became the first Earl of Manvers. In 1868, the third Earl of Manvers, Sidney Pierpoint, had the house demolished and rebuilt to the grand house we see today. It measures 55 metres by 48 metres and has four floors. After the sixth Earl of Manvers died in 1655, there was no male to continue the name, so the house stayed with his wife, Countess of Manvers, and her family. In 1979, the coal board bought the house. There was a threat of subsidence due to mining at nearby Forsby Colliery. The coal board sold the estate 10 years later, and then it went from owner to owner until Warner Leisure Hotels acquired the estate, and in the year 2000, made the property into a luxury 200 room hotel and spa. From this view, it looks a bit like Bewley, as in down the south of England, where the Motor Museum is. They're a grand old house, a little bit bigger than my little tent. So I've just come across this, uh, as it says on stable ground, it's a bit of a like, sinkhole, but uh, this area is Forsby, uh, where we started today was the biggest colliery in Nottinghamshire. So with that saying about the yes, little sinkhole there in front of us, who knows, 50 years time, this old building here might be uh, in a sinkhole here itself. All built local Nottinghamshire sandstone, I would have thought. Well, well there seems to be pockets of uh, unstable ground all over the place. Uh, in the middle of this field. 
there's another area fenced off uh, I think it'll probably be the same thing then if we move across to our right just in the centre of the picture now there's another area fenced off with a, a similar sort of sign and moving over to our right near the fence there's another area all these little sinkholes seem to be appearing all over the estate not a good sign but I well, this area was the biggest coal colliery in Nottinghamshire. It opened in 1925 and became one of the most productive coal pits in Britain until its close in 2015. The shaft went to a depth of 800 metres, which now is starting to show from the sinkholes that the surface ground is now becoming unstable. Another one of those interesting little signs. Veteran tree management. This area is fenced off to preserve woodland Protect wildlife and to ensure your safety, please keep out. And as you can see, there's a fence all around it. There's no chance of you getting in there. Or is there? You go on that side, there's no fence at all on this side. So in front of us, we have the Church of Perils Fort. So it's called St. John the Evangelist, built by the third Earl and cost £17,000 in 1876. Poor construction of the walls meant it needed extensive work just 28 years later. Over further years, local mining caused the church to subside, in which several of the bells in the church were removed in case of falling. And now five out of the six bells have been moved to one of the churches in West Bridford in Nottingham. And just going down that way is Pell's Fort, uh, where the staff of Forsby used to live. But uh, we're going this way. We're going to head over to there. So in front of us, we have the book gates. So the gates were the original entrance to the estate. The wooden gates and lodge were destroyed by a fire in 1956. But the stone arches on either side of the Duke's carriageway and the two molten lead facing books only needed minor repairs, which were done at the nearby woodyard. Afterwards, the stone arches and books were rehoused at White Lodge. I remember there was a child between the books, but now they're long gone. A stolen in the 80s, most likely melted down for lead. We are at the works near White Lodge and we can see the works is uh, farming and in front of us is one hell of a big pile of beet. Sherwood Hideaway, permissible path, follow Waymark route. So we've just arrived at the book gates. Now I know that the lodge house was burnt down in 1956. I did expect the book gates to be a bit more than this. A cattle grid. Anyway, next point of call is back into Sherwood Forest, down towards the Forestry Visitor Centre. So thank you for joining me on this walk today. I hope we all discovered some interesting things about Robin Hood and his companions. And if you would like to follow this route for yourself, there will be a link in the description of the route now the full route is about eight to nine miles. If you'd like to see some more of me, and if you can like it and comment, that'd be great too. Anyway, I think that's enough for me today. So thank you, and bye-de-bye, -bye, hikers.